Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, how's it going? It's great to see you guys. Uh, During the first service, I came out way too early and just stood over there awkward on the side. So this went a lot smoother so far. Although they were going for it. I was tempted to come back out and just be their hype man from the back and just kind of hands up. Uh, But it's fun to be here with you guys. My name is Mike DiStefano. Uh, I was the young adult pastor here for three years uh, before going off to seminary in Boston. Uh, The last time, it's been a long time since I've been here with you guys. Uh, The last time I was scheduled to preach here, uh, my dad was in a bad car accident. And so I ended up spending like the week in the hospital with him. And Ken and Dan and those guys just said, just go be with him. And uh, so I sent Dan Slagle my notes and he just took them and preached them. And uh, there's a reason why the young guys on staff used to call him Dandolph. Um, it's because, because he's a wizard, right? He just got up and did it. So if there was a particularly good sermon that you remember of Dan's uh, recently, now you know where that came from. So, um, But uh, it's fun to be back with you guys. Uh, I was at seminary, uh, just to give you a couple of quick updates. Uh, I was at seminary for the last three years. Uh, this church supported me. I could not have done it uh, without you guys. I was already working a couple of jobs and like just on the verge of like giving blood for money, you know, because seminary is expensive. But uh, so thank you so much. I graduated October 13th. Uh, so that was exciting. Um, but what I, what I really want to say thank you for, the real reason uh, that I'm speaking in this moment is to thank you for uh, your generous gift to Passion City Church. Uh, we've been there for a couple of months and we've been active in the city for about a month. And already God is blowing the doors off of our expectations. I mean, truly, like we, we got to the city. We were like, we don't know if anyone knows us. We don't know if anyone cares. And people, you know, told us different things about DC and we showed up and man, people are spiritually hungry and uh, we're getting to bring the word and, uh, and they're responding and it's been incredible. So um, my love language has never necessarily been gift giving, but man, we are feeling the love from that. So thank you so much. Uh, for your support. Um, Love you guys. And uh, I'm excited for what God has for us this morning. So let me pray for us and we'll jump in. Well, Lord, thank you for this church. Thank you for uh, the people that are here. God, thanks that this isn't just uh, a gathering. Thanks that this isn't just uh, a bunch of people in a room, but it's actually an opportunity for us to interact with the God of the universe, uh, that you're here among us, Thank you that you love us, God. Thank you for the incredible impact that not only your church is having in the world, but this church is having here in spring and the effect that that is rippling out from this place that life is spreading from Faith Bridge Church in Spring, Texas. And we feel that in DC and so many people in Houston feel that in the wake of Harvey. God, thank you for the generous heart of these people. Um, Thank you that I get to be here among family Lord, I pray for our time now as we turn to your word. God, may we encounter you. Lord, my prayer for this morning is that we would look and we would behold a king, a king of righteousness, and that the effect of righteousness would be peace, and the result of righteousness would be quietness, trust forever. We love you, Lord, and uh, we're grateful for this time, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, I recently read a biography on the life of J.R.R. Tolkien, who was in Oxford Dawn and uh, the beloved author of The Hobbit in The Lord of the Rings. Um, I think the draw to reading a biography is that you get a a window into the subject's personal life. So you get to find out things like their interests, uh, their family, their friends. Most people don't realize that uh, it was Tolkien who led C.S. Lewis, the great Christian thinker and apologist to Christ. Uh, Those guys became good buddies. They would get together every week at their local pub and smoke their pipes and talk about writing and Jesus. And uh, one of my favorite anecdotes from their friendship was Tolkien was, I'm sorry, Lewis was a professor at Oxford when Tolkien arrived. And we have a record of the notes that he kept the day that he met him. Apparently Tolkien made an impression on Lewis and he wrote in his journal, he said of Tolkien, uh, he's a smooth, pale, fluent little chap. And then he said, no harm in him, only needs a smack or so, right? And you're like, (laughs) And a true friendship began, right? Where Lewis is like, hey man, nice to meet you. Ah, 
Ah, right? Like, and it was just like, they were buddies from the beginning. And so you get a window into their personal life and you also get a window into their creative process. Particularly fascinating for me is that Tolkien began writing The Lord of the Rings in response to the popularity of The Hobbit, but he had no idea what the story was about. And so if you've ever tried to read it and the hobbits are just wandering around aimlessly and you're like, Tom Bomba who? And none of this was in the movie. And if you almost gave up there or did give up, you are not alone because Tolkien almost quit writing. It wasn't until The Hobbits got to Bree that Tolkien became fascinated with the little ring. And he says, I followed the ring to Mount Doom. The ring revealed the story to me is the way he describes it. And Tolkien's main character, Frodo, becomes equally enthralled with this little treasure. It was a thing of immense beauty and power and Frodo became obsessed with it. And in the end, he was mastered by it. You remember he gets to the end and he can't cast it out. And you go, why? Well, because his treasure became his obsession, and his obsession became his master. And Tolkien sort of unearths for us this deep human truth that is what has our hearts, has our eyes, has our lives. What we treasure, we worship, and what we worship, we obey. And what's so fascinating about that is that Jesus talks about this. This is biblical. In Matthew chapter six, just before the passage, that says, do not be anxious about your life. A lot of us know that passage. I've preached that passage here. Many of us have memorized it. We're familiar with it because in our day, anxiety is plaguing our culture. And yet what many of us don't realize is that that passage actually starts off with the word therefore. It says, therefore, do not be anxious. Why mention that? Well, to prove that I went to seminary. If I learned anything, <laughs> if I learned anything in seminary, it's that you always have to ask, what's the therefore, therefore, right? Why? Because this command, do not be anxious, is rooted in a truth that precedes it. And Jesus is saying, if you understand this, then you can do this. And so what's that truth? It's this idea that what has our hearts, draws our eyes, has our lives. What we, wor what we treasure, we worship. And what we worship, we obey. And I want us to see that uh, today, together. And I want to talk about it because I just moved to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, with Ben and Donna to help start Passion City Church. And we've already gotten to meet a lot of people in the city and I've gotten to sit down with them and have conversations and ask them questions about life in DC. And far too often early in the conversation, the word struggle comes up. When I ask them, how is it living in DC? And usually for many of them, it's centered around this feeling of disillusionment, that expectations didn't meet reality, right? A lot of people, young people especially, move to DC because they wanna make a difference. They wanna be a part of something important beyond themselves and they get there and they run into corruption and frustration and apathy, right? Uh, one of the guys that I met with early on, he said, I moved to DC from Georgia with two big dreams. One, to rise up in my organization and make an impact for the Lord. And two, to move into an inner city neighborhood and be a positive influence on children. And he's been at his company for a year and a half and gotten nowhere. And um, he started a Bible study and no one, no one came, no one cared. And then he moved into this lower income neighborhood and was held up at gunpoint. And you're like, man, that's a rough start. Like, it's like taking your kids to Disney World and finding out they no longer believe in happiness. You're like, geez, this is not how I thought this was gonna go, right? And so many of us, we wanna live lives that matter, right? All of us do. We wanna be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We yearn for significance. And yet Alexis de Tocqueville in his famous trip to America, he described the people of this country and he said, a strange melancholy haunts the inhabitants in the midst of their abundance. And I've seen that in DC. And yet I don't think it's just a DC problem. I think it's a human problem. And yet the Bible has a lot to say about living lives that matter. And at the center of that message is this concept of worship. The Bible has a lot to say about that. Why? Because worship determines the quality and direction of our lives. And so it's important to know that what we treasure, we worship. And what we worship, we obey. And see, here's the thing. This isn't just a Christian truth. If you're in the room this morning and you're not a believer, this is a human truth. Uh, David Foster Wallace, he's a famous author, uh, philosopher. He was an atheist. He didn't believe in God, but he believed in worship. And he said this, he said, here's something that's weird and also true. He said, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there's actually no such thing as atheism. He said, there's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. 
He said, an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. <laughs> worship money and things. If they're where you tap your real meaning in life, then you'll never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they plant you. Worship power, you'll feel weak and afraid. You'll need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. And he says, look, the, the really insidious things about these forms of worship is not that they're necessarily evil or sinful. He said it's that they're unconscious. There are default settings. And so I wanna look at this passage um, because Jesus talks about this. He talks about this reality that our treasure becomes our obsession, becomes our master. And yet something about that idea, that framework, if we understand it properly, frees us up to live worry-free, anxiety-free lives. And so I wanna look at that together. So it's in Matthew chapter six, starting in verse 19. We're gonna read the whole thing together. If you don't have a Bible, I wanna encourage you to take one of these. This is gonna be Bible study, y'all. So uh, you can grab that, open your own, look through it. If you know someone that doesn't have a Bible, you're welcome to steal our Bibles. Uh, you're, you can just take them uh, and um, give that to a friend or keep it for yourself. Uh, so we're gonna read it together. Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter six, did I say 19? Matthew chapter six, beginning in verse 19. It says this. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. So Jesus starts off uh, this three-pronged message, and uh, he says, don't store up treasures on earth. Do store up treasures in heaven. What does he mean? Well, he's just being totally straightforward. He's saying, don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. Do store up for yourself treasures in heaven where there are no moths and there are no thieves, right? And he keeps using this word treasure. And so what does he mean by that? Well, that word can mean just money, but more often than not in our New Testament, it actually refers to a room where you would stockpile your most valuable possessions. And so it goes deeper than just money. It's the things that you value at a deep heart level. Uh, so I just reread the book, um, Treasure Island, uh, not in preparation for this, but it worked out. Um, mainly because I've been trying to eliminate technology before bedtime and I love story time. So uh, just jumped into that. And um, how does that book start off? Anyone remember? There's the moment where the old sea captain shows up in his dirty ratty clothes and all he has with him is a box of possessions. And we don't really know what it is, but as the story progresses, we realize it's, there's something valuable and special about that. But it's not long into the story that he gets the black spot. You remember that? He finds out that he's a marked man and he realizes if I don't leave this place, then my life is forfeit. And yet he's sort of ill and he realizes I can't leave and pick this up. He didn't have the strength to do it. So he just keeps telling himself, I'll recover, I'll get better. And when I do, I'll be able to pick this up and take it with me. And he never does, right? He dies literally on top of the box. And you go, his heart was so tethered to the contents of that box that he couldn't leave it. He couldn't physically bring himself to do it. And that's what Jesus is talking about. What is it that's in that box for you? What is it that you value so much that you couldn't imagine your life without it and you would rather die than leave it? And he says, be careful. Don't store up treasure on earth. Why? Because moths might eat it, which is sort of an underwhelming, you know, like he doesn't say like a lion might come. He didn't even give you like an angry badger, right? Like uh, there's no mention of demogorgons. He's just like a moth. And uh, what could a moth destroy in that day for Jesus's original listeners? Their clothes were susceptible and the, um, the tent-like flaps that would go over their, their doors, their homes. And clothes signified status. They still do today. And homes signified security. And Jesus says, be careful. 
that you don't treasure those at the deepest heart level, status and security. Why? Because something as small as a moth can destroy that. They're fleeting. They're here today and gone tomorrow. And he says, even if your stuff isn't in any particular danger right now of being uh, fading away, he says, at any moment, a thief can break in and steal, right? Thieves uh, make your things vulnerable. Gollum can bite your finger off at any moment. So don't, don't let your guard down, right? And he's saying, don't treasure that which is temporary, vulnerable, fleeting. Do treasure that which is uh, eternal and secure in the heavens. He says, for, which indicates reason, And it's interesting, he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's in this verse that he switches from the plural form of the word you to the singular. And so he's been sort of talking in generalities, don't you do this, and he's just sort of talking to a group, and then he makes the application personal. He says, for you, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Where your treasure is, that's where you're gonna find your heart gravitating. And for you, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he's trying to show us He's trying to teach us that the location of your treasure will determine the direction of your life. And so he says, don't treasure that which is temporary, fleeting, vulnerable. Do treasure that which is eternal and secure, right? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be. It's gonna determine the direction of your life because the things that we treasure naturally draw our gaze. We naturally look at and think about the things that we love, right? And so he switches. He transitions from talking about the heart to talking about the eyes. Did you catch that? In verse 22, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And he starts off and he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. And what does he mean? He means it's the source. It's the thing through which your body takes in and he switches the metaphor from that which is temporary versus Uh, eternal to that which is uh, light versus darkness, right? He says, and what you take in is what you become. It's like saying, well, and then he says, um, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Which is kind of a cryptic sentence. It's a little bit confusing the way he words it, but that's just like saying, if the food in you is poison, how great and final and terrible is that poison? And he's trying to intensify. He's saying, be alert to the finality of this, to the severity of it. This is important. And so what's he saying? Be careful, little eyes, what you see. He says, be careful what you look at. And so two things to pay attention to. Number one, what are you looking at? In your unconscious moments, what are the things that your mind naturally drifts to, that you stare at, that you obsess over? And I'm talking about obsessions. So for you, is it page after page of sports, the stock market, your bank account? Is it fashion? Is it the life of celebrity, entertainment, right? What are you obsessing over? But then the second thing to pay attention to is more important than the first. And it's not just pay attention to what you're looking at, but pay attention to the way you're perceiving the things that you're looking at. And so when you're scrolling through Instagram, are you seeing objects to envy, people to use, or are you seeing people like Jesus saw them? like sheep without a shepherd, in desperate need of someone moving towards them with the message of life or with human kindness, right? Or to say it positively, when you look out at the world, are you seeing people made in the image of God, beautiful but broken by sin that you get to step into and be a part of God's purposes? To use maybe your understanding of sports or your financial savvy or your fashion sense to promote human flourishing? Or are you seeing dollar signs to stockpile? And Jesus is saying, be careful how you're looking at things. Be careful of the way you're perceiving him. It's either gonna be dark or it's gonna be light. It's gonna be temporary or it's gonna be eternal. So when you look out, are you looking out with the eyes of heaven or are you taking in darkness? And he's saying, you can't look at it both ways. You need wholehearted, single-hearted devotion. If you try to look at both, you'll go cross-eyed. And so he says, be careful of the way you look at the world because our, what we treasure draws our gaze. What has our hearts has our eyes has our lives. What we treasure, we worship, and what we worship, we obey. And so Jesus is gonna move in the next verse from our obsession to our obedience. And he says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the illustration intensifies again, and he invokes his strongest language in this last couple of verses. He says, no one can serve two masters, and he uses images of slavery and masters, right? And that's a stark image. And yet it's not necessarily a one-to-one. When we hear Jesus' words, we can't think of American slavery in the 1800s. It was a totally different system. It was based on reciprocity. And so you would do something for someone and out of wholehearted, there was a freedom to it, out of wholehearted devotion, you would devote yourself to serve that person. And so it was a, a, a gratitude for someone doing something for you that you could never do for yourself. And Jesus is saying, you need that wholehearted devotion. He says, you can't serve both God and mammon. He says, if you do, you'll be like Mrs. Doubtfire trying to have dinner in two different places at one time at the same restaurant. You remember that movie when he's going back and forth and he keeps switching from the fat suit and one moment he's funny, hairy Daniel Hillard and the next moment he's the cheeky, responsible uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, right? You remember that? Has anyone seen that movie? It was a big part of my childhood, but I didn't realize how much cross-dressing you know, was part of my childhood, but he's going, he's going back and forth, right? And he can't remember what he said to who and where he's supposed to be at which time. And Jesus is saying, that's going to be you. Eventually, you're going to show up at the wrong table with your fat suit, right? <laughs> he says, you can't be devoted to both. You can't be. It'll be frantic. You'll feel disintegrated. You won't feel whole. And so question, to what does your heart ascribe its greatest worth and value? And I want to talk about this because I just think so many of us, man, we want to live lives that matter, right? Like, we want to live in a way that's important, that's meaningful. And yet so many of us, even the ones of us that deeply want to please God, we find ourselves continuing to struggle. And we keep messing up in a particular issue. And we say, I'm never going to do that again. And then we do it again. We don't want to talk to those people that way. We don't want to look at that particular thing. And we say, I'm never going to do it again. And then we do it again. And then there's people that want to live lives that are meaningful, that glorify God, and that matter. And yet we're slaves to fear. And we're anxious people. And we feel disintegrated. And we go, why? Well, I think for so many of us, we try to fight this at the level of obedience. And Jesus is saying, you're starting at the wrong place. You can't beat this here. But you can start the diagnosis here. And so you go, what am I naturally obeying? What's my default setting? And then go, what have I been obsessing over that led me to this place? And then you take a step back. And you go, what is the deep treasure of my heart that led to that obsession? And when you're here, realize this treasure has become my master. And when you're in that place, you can begin to look up and go, what is the true treasure What's the better treasure? And well, many of us will look up and we'll be introduced to a God who is before all things, the source of all things, the ultimate source of power and beauty in this universe. And we see in him not only power and beauty, but closeness. We see in Jesus, someone who would come and be near to us and teach us and and be with us. And then as we begin to see this, the gospel reorients our affections and we can start to sound like Augustine who said how sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys which I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me, you who are the true sovereign joy. You drove them from me and you took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure. Oh Lord, my God, my light, my wealth, my salvation. And as we begin to look to him and see in him the most beautiful thing in the universe, our hearts will be reoriented and will have a new obsession and that obsession will turn to worship. And as we worship him, we'll begin to naturally move with him and we'll find ourselves living lives that are of cosmic significance. And that's where we want to end up. And I want that for this church because I feel like so many of us are living anxious lives and we need to see there is a beautiful treasure that leads to a beautiful obsession that leads to a perfect king. And when I realize that I'm not the master of me and none of these things that I've been obsessing over and have been controlling my life have any control over me anymore. Anxiety dissipates as we realize that the one who created the universe is the king over my life. I have a good master. I have a good king, and he will take care of me. And so in one of our first weeks in D.C., we had just gotten to the city, and um, we decided to go to a concert. There was a band that some of us wanted to see, and there was also a bunch of people and we were like, these are the people that we want to reach and it'll be fun to be out and among them and, and, and see them. And so we got there and there were thousands of people. It was like their ACL. It was a music festival for the weekend. And we went on the, 
like the main day where everyone kind of came to see the main uh, band. And uh, we went out there, and it was exciting because we were like, these are the people we want to reach, and we see them, and they're definitely here. And uh, it started off fun, but then it kind of got a little weird, you know, because it was, it was a concert, and people were getting crazy. Dudes started taking off their shirts, and we're like, why are you doing that? And uh, there was some, like, sloppy alcohol play, and at one point, we're standing there, and some smoke hit my face, and I was like, I don't, I don't think that was tobacco. Uh, I'm pretty sure the Passion City staff is getting secondhand high right now. So uh, we took a couple of just sort of steps back and I just sort of went into observation mode. And it was so interesting in that moment to see this crowd full of thousands of people and they're singing and they're rejoicing and that's awesome. And they had their hands up and that was, it was just kind of, what, what are we singing to? And right before their like main song, the one that everyone came to hear, the, uh, the front man hit, went back to the piano and hit this low, somber kind of note. And he just, doom, and he let it get quiet in the room. And then he hit it again and he said, this is the first note of the first song that I wrote years ago, thinking about this moment as I would write sad songs about my loneliness so that I could come to places like this and play the mess out of them so that I wouldn't have to be lonely anymore. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. And I was like, that is the most depressing sentence that I've ever heard. Uh, but the whole crowd was like, yeah. Like they got it. They got it. They were like, in this moment, we don't have to be lonely. And that broke my heart. And then they started singing in their main song, and some of you will know it, but it's over and over throughout the song, they sing, I want to get better. I want to get better. And here are thousands of young people singing it out like a prayer. And the tragic thing about that is that song is about the inevitability of failure in that endeavor. It's about suicide. So if you like that song, I'm sorry if I just ruined it for you. But I was sitting there in that moment and I was just thinking, I don't think that we're the answer to their prayer, but I think I know the one who is. And we know the true treasure of the universe. We know the one thing that we can look to, that we can find beauty in, that we can know and walk with, that won't destroy us, but that will cause flourishing to rise up in our hearts. And so we want that, we want that. And that's what I want for this church. And that's what I want for, for this nation. And so we believe that it's moments like this where we reorient our affections to God and we look to him, that he begins to reorient our lives and make us a force for good and allows us to walk in a, in a meaningful, significant way in our time here. And so let me pray for us. Uh, in this moment and just talk to this God that we're worshiping. Well, Lord, thank you for this time and this space to just look into your word. God, thank you for the wisdom of your scripture that helps us to understand why we do the things that we do. Thank you, God, for the ability to look into your word, to hear your voice, to be guided by your Holy Spirit. God, I just pray that in this moment, some of us would have that realization that this treasure, this thing that I value above all else has led to some really destructive behavior. And this is the first time that I've really seen that. I, I, I get it. That's why I do the things that I do. And so maybe that's already dawned on some of you, but for others of you, I would just ask that you would take a minute and say, God, help me to understand the deep treasures of my heart. What am I valuing above all else? And it doesn't necessarily need to be a sinful or evil thing, but maybe it's something that you're obsessing over that's just not worthy of your ultimate worship. And just ask him, God, teach me something about myself. And while we're in this place, Just talk to God and ask him to reveal himself as he is. Not in our broken understanding, not in our fears, but just the true king of the universe, the treasure above all treasures. Say, God, reveal yourself to me as you are. And so, Lord, we know that where our treasure is, there our heart will be. And so, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would just infuse this place, that you would enter into our 
our quiet moments and you would make this a holy, a holy place, God, where our affections would be reoriented to you, our minds would be captured by you and our feet would naturally start walking with you, God. And so Lord, I just pray that in this moment as a response to the treasure that you are, that we would lift our voices in worship, that we would look and behold a king and that we would say, I'll stand for that king and I'll walk with him and I'll follow him and I'll commit my life to know him. And so, Lord, we're just so grateful for this space. We're so grateful for this moment. And, um, and we pray that in the powerful name of your son, Jesus, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director here at FaithBridge, and I'm here today with Mike DeStefano, who just brought us a message, Obsession and Obedience. Welcome back, Mike. Thank you. What a pleasure to have you back here on that side of the chair. Yeah, yeah. so fun yes. to be back with family. So, um, you are uh, back with us after finishing seminary. Congratulations. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Feels and uh, are with Passion City. And so today you uh, looked at Matthew chapter six, mm -hmm. uh, where Jesus is teaching. Um, and we talked about your treasure and your heart. And one of the things that you talked about was this idea of worship. Mm -hmm. um, even talking about how even outside of the church, this is a concept that your what you worship is what your life will be about, what your heart is about. Um, and so I think for a lot of us, when we hear the word worship, mm -hmm. um, I know for me, I default to thinking about worship service or worship music or mm -hmm. singing or being in church on Sunday morning during praise and worship. Yeah. Um, but the Bible gives us a very different picture of a more fuller picture yeah. of the what the word worship means. Can you speak to that? What do you mean when you say worship? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting to answer that question from the perspective of like a David Foster Wallace mm -hmm. who used the word worship over and over again. Uh, he would say, everybody worships. There's no such thing as not worshiping. And you go, for a non-believer, someone who doesn't believe in God, what does he mean when he says the word worship? And that's an interesting way to come about it because uh, he actually takes it out of like a religious jargon sense and he mm -hmm. makes it real, you know, real life worship. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting about that is he gets nearer to the heart of what worshiping is in the Bible than oftentimes what Christians yeah. think. Because oftentimes, like you said, we think of just singing maybe, mm -hmm. uh, or that's the song portion of the service, mm -hmm. but the Bible has something much deeper in mind um, when it talks about worship. And so uh, a great example of that would be Romans uh, chapter 12, mm -hmm. verse one and two, when uh, Paul says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, for this is your spiritual worship. Mm -hmm. And he takes body, flesh, and spirit, and he says, when you present your body, when it's your whole mind, heart, will given to God as a sacrifice, that is spiritual worship. Mm -hmm. And so it's not disconnected in any way from what you think, what you feel, and then what you actually do. Mm -hmm. And that's worship. It's a whole body, yeah, whole so life, like our whole, whole mind commitment. Life worships God. Totally. And you tied that to obedience. Mm -hmm. um, because when we when we worship God, we obey him yeah. when we're following what he wants with our minds and our bodies and our heart and we're saying surrender mm -hmm. all of it that that yeah. uh, allows us to be obedient and i like how you talked about how uh, a lot of us struggle with like feeling like oh gosh i always mess up like i want to <laughs> i want to yeah. follow god and i want to pursue him but yet i find mm -hmm. myself failing and not being obedient and how worship is such a huge mm -hmm. part yeah. of um, our lives and our hearts. So yeah. great message well, today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, but also while we're here, let's catch up like yeah. of what you've been doing <laughs> uh, since we've seen you. So yeah. you're with Passion City now yep. in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. So tell us what your role is there and what you're working on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, joint staff. Um, I, I spent a little bit of time there this summer just kind of getting into the passion world because there was a period of time where I was going to help plant Passion City Church and had never been to Passion City Church. <laughs> and so I got to go just learn the culture and uh, it's just been incredible. Like it's a group of people that are fiercely committed to the glory of God, His radical grace, and then lives extended in worship. And so, um, so I actually finished seminary in October, officially, uh, turned in my last paper for seminary, packed up my car, drove to DC and just started work. And we've been just blown and going since. So um, I am, my official title, 
is director of community and formation. Okay. So I'm overseeing what we would call grow groups, but what mm -hmm. we're calling community, community groups, groups yeah. over there. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, eventually I'll get to help start college ministry, youth ministry, things like that. Um, right now, we have done a couple of vision nights. Mm -hmm. So just garnering interest, it's sort of just introductions, shaking hands. Uh, but the thing that we're really funneling people to is community groups because mm -hmm. that's beyond an introduction so builds, into real builds life. A foundation, yeah. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. what we've been telling people. Like we didn't show up in the city just to shake hands. We came to link arms, and we we just believe that this is the group of people that God's going to use to be a transformative presence in D.C. And so it's such an honor and privilege to get to help lead those and think through the direction that those will go in the next few years. So yeah, that's uh, exciting. Yeah, it's awesome. It really it's is. It's been really cool. All right. Well, we love following along with the journey and that. Uh, Faith Bridgers were so generous, just <laughs> radically generous in, yeah, in helping oh uh, Passion City and Ben and you guys. And so we'll be following and yeah. praying and uh, look forward to hearing more about the exciting things that God's going to do through yeah. Passion City, D.C. Well, thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you for being here with today. It was a great message. Thanks. Uh, thank you for joining us here today for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.